Hey guys, 14th gen Intel CPUs are just around the corner and we have a refresh on the motherboard. Here we have a Z790 motherboard from Asus, which is an ROG Maximus Z790 Dark Hero. It's a refresh, so it's a bit of the same what we had up to this point, but there are a few things that have changed. Uh, one of the primary things is we now have Wi-Fi 7 in here. It's kind of funny how over the years the Wi-Fi just keeps changing and like personally, we've got pretty advanced system here and we've only just moved to Wi-Fi 6. But hey, somebody needs to start the trend and it seems that like Asus is starting with Wi-Fi 7. This is a refresh, as I said, but this is kind of a funky one. This motherboard supports 12, 13 and 14th gen. You kind of get a lot of support in this, but at the same time, this is the end of the road for this particular platform. I believe 15th gen was going to be using the next generation motherboards and they're probably not going to be compatible with the older stuff, but we'll have to see. Let's get inside and have a look what we get. This definitely looks really, really cool. And it is, as you can see, pretty heavy. Definitely a clean looking board. Uh, this is like a little screen that can be used for just displaying uh, animations. We'll have to see that when we boot it up, but that won't be until main review of the uh, next gen CPUs. Um, you do have the rest of the board being kind of this blackout style and I really like that. Before further coming the board, let's check what else we get in the box. We get a sticker pack, a web storage bonus thing, but I think what's cool is this. So this is actually a quick start guide rather than a full manual. For the full manual, you need to scan the little QR code and get it online. But the quick start guide actually has the most important thing that I feel that I need when I open up the manual. It's just the lines, like the description of where everything goes. It has actually nice pictures for somebody who's just starting up building. It's cool that you can be up and running very, very quickly with this and you literally see the full motherboard details on the front here. Also, you have a little ROG pass and then all the usual accessories. A little USB for your BIOS and drivers. I believe that's an adapter to be used with the fans. And then we have the usual stuff. So you got a keychain, lots of different adapters, some extra thermal pads for the M.2 drives, a bunch of little accessories. You also have a RGB header, it's a little cable for expansion, some SATA cables, and a Wi-Fi antenna. This is a bit different. So usual Wi-Fi antennas has been, you have to twist it in to get it in. And it's just been, honestly, it's been kind of a pain. Asus has improved on the design. The connectors on here are now just the push connectors. So rather than having to sit there and twist them in, you just click them in, and you're done. And you can pull them out the same way. This is so much better. I, you can't even imagine how many times I've had to twist them in and actually I've broken a few of these cables because, well, we set up multiple motherboards and, you know, while that might not be the usual for most people, uh, for me, that's very convenient. Just plug it in and you're good to go. And you have obviously the antenna with adjustable. It also has a magnet in here, so you can actually mount it to some metal surface and you can position it anywhere you like. I obviously wouldn't mount it to the back of the motherboard, but you can put it on the side of the case and just stick it up whichever way. Uh, they also have a special utility in Armor Crate that you can use it for positioning the Wi-Fi for the optimal conditions. So it's just a nice little touch. I, I definitely like the push pin, pin connections. And as I said, it's Wi-Fi 7, so next gen. Not that you're gonna have many Wi-Fi 7 devices right now, but there's a perk to that is less Wi-Fi 7 devices, more space for Wi-Fi 7 signal for your device. Let's now walk through the actual motherboard itself. So as I mentioned, it supports 12 to 14th gen because it's using the LJ1700 socket. As always, it has an overpowered power delivery. It's using 20 plus one power stages. It also has BP heat sinks. So you can see them over here. So also this is a heat sink for the PCIe connection. Uh, you have four dim slots. Um, this generation, uh, you can go up to 8,000 mega transfers and above. The Apex motherboard can support up to 8,400 and in some cases above. That's obviously enthusiast grade, uh, or in this case, 8,000 plus, it's more like pro, pro, 
normal clock agreed, but it is possible. These are the boards to do it. Um, you've got the two power connectors at the top for those power hungry CPUs, especially if you're doing the overclocking. And if you're getting a board like this, I would definitely recommend you doing overclocking. Otherwise, probably get a cheaper board because you're always kind of wasting it. Um, unless you need some other specific features. About the memory, you can go up to 192 gigabytes if you use the non-binary memory, which is really cool in this kind of platform. We've gone away from the days where you only can do 128 gigabytes. So that's really cool for those who need to do more workstation kind of stuff. Especially with the CPUs nowadays, they're powerful enough to do workstation workloads. Let's talk about PCIe. So this is a PCIe Gen 5 motherboard. So it has PCIe both for the NVMe drives and the two slots. So both these Time16 slots are connected directly to the CPU via PCIe Gen 5, as well as the top NVMe slot. But there are a few caveats. If you were to plug in more than one device, you will be enabling automatically bifurcation because from CPU, there are only 20 lanes. And out of the 20 lanes, 16 are PCIe Gen 5 and four are PCIe Gen 4. Therefore, if you were to plug in a PCIe Gen 5 graphics card in the top slot, then NVMe drive cannot be used and the second PC slot can't be used. If you were to plug in a graphics card and one other device, so let's say graphics card, which is time 16, and a Gen 5 SSD in here, what will happen is this will be enabled as Gen 5, so you'll have four lanes for the NVMe drive and you'll have half the lanes, which is eight lanes for the top slot. If you then want to install an additional slot below, you can't because you have limited. So what you can do is you can do 16, which is just a graphics card, a 8 plus 8, or 4 plus 8. There's actually a pretty significant downside here because there currently aren't any PC Gen 5 graphics cards on the market. So if you were to plug in a PC Gen 5 SSD and a graphics card, you'll all be getting eight lanes. So with the likes of 1490, you might actually be leaving some performance on the table. So just be aware of that. Um, and then at the bottom, we also have a PC Gen 4, four lanes. These are connected directly to the uh, PCH, so the, the actual chipset as well. On top of all of this, we do have a PC Gen 4 times 4 SSD or NVMe connection just below here. So the NVMe 2.2 is connected directly to the CPU. It's just somewhere below this heatsink. And then you have another three SSDs which are connected up to the chipset. So you can do a total of single PC Gen 5 NVMe drive and four PC Gen 4 NVMe drive on the system. Only two of those will be connected to the CPU and the other three will be connected directly to the chipset and then you'd be limited to only four lanes of the PC traffic for the graphics card. I know it's a bit unconvoluted, but hopefully it gives you an understanding of where your limitations might be. Um, it's kind of the opposite of what AMD has done. AMD with this generation has given 24 lanes in PC Gen 5. So you have plenty of connectivity in basically any way you want. With Intel, you don't get that just yet. Uh, hopefully with the next generations, we'll see an improvement on that front. Next, let's talk about general connections. So we also have four SATA ports down here. So for just general hard drives or normal SSDs. Uh, we also got um, USB type three. So this is just type A, that would be the five gigabit option. Over here, we have USB type C for the front header, which is up to 20 gigabit. And it also supports up to 60 watts charging. But for to use the 60 watts, you actually need to have this PCIe connector as well. This has the front header connectors on the side over here. We also have extra USB 3 and USB 2 connectors down below. To add it all up, we also have a whole stack of RGB headers and fan headers. You have plenty for basically anything you would ever need. Also, you have four RGB headers, three are ARGB headers and a single standard older style RGB header. Let's work through the back. We have two buttons at the top. So we've got the BIOS flashback and clear CMOS. These are very useful, especially if you're doing overclocking, you need to fix stuff. And then we have uh, a bunch of USBs. So just something to be aware of. These are, you actually can see with USBs, they actually have the speed written just above, which is a nice touch. So we have four USB 3s with the five gigabits. The red ones are all at 10 gigabits, uh, even the BIOS one, which connects directly to the CPU. And you've got two Thunderbolt connections. So these are USB 4 Thunderbolts, 
so they can connect uh, monitors as well if you need it and they connect directly to the CPU. So these two ports as well as the BIOS port connect directly to the CPU and you have another USB type C 10 gigabit down here. So in total you have plenty of connectivity for basically anything you want. And then for network we have two and a half gigabit connection here and obviously we've got the Wi-Fi 7 ports at the back and the usual audio as well. I do like the fact that the motherboard still comes with at least a single display connector. So we have a HDMI connector at the top. That's probably not gonna be useful for gaming because if you're buying a motherboard like this, you're gonna have a dedicated graphics card. But it's very useful for doing troubleshooting when you have a graphics card issue or any others. You can start with just setting up the system with the graphics card built in, which is the one on the CPU, providing you have one. And you can troubleshoot any problems you have. Then you work your way up and make sure that the graphics card is working and so on. So that's just a nice touch to have built-in ports. And lastly, let's cover some of the Asus specific features. So what, one thing that's nice with Asus mobile boards is you have this little Q latch. So you can take the NVMe drive, you put it in, and no screws, you just kind of tighten it down. And you can do that on any of them, which is really, really cool. Uh, this one even has two of them pre-connected already. Same process, you kind of slot it in, down, and lock it down. Something to be, bear in mind though is you do need to make sure to remove the little protective plastic when you're storing the NVMe, otherwise you're literally going to be heating up plastic and that's actually the counterintuitive in this situation. And you'll have the same thermal pads on both sides. Yeah. And that's where you have extra thermal pads for these ones um, in the box. So you have plenty here. The other nice feature is this little Q release. You can just easily remove it. Let me just quickly show it to you. Graphics goes in and you can't remove it. So rather than having to reach in here and try to open it up, you can just press this button and remove it. In comparison, if you look at the bottom slot, which doesn't have it, it's in. So you have to find your way to this little latch over here. The problem is, if you have a bunch of different devices and a heat sink, this becomes very, very hard to reach, especially if you have to kind of reach in between other water cooling devices or whatever else. So it's not as convenient. Not the most important thing for people who would be using this, you know, set it up once and leave it. But if you need to troubleshoot your motherboard or you need to troubleshoot your graphics card, that is such a such an nice uh, feature that I personally use a lot. Uh, other features also include things like, you know, the start button and the, the, the error codes. So with a board like this, if you could be overclocking, you will likely do some messing around and sometimes you might need to clear CMOS, again, the button on the back, or you might need to do just start and restart from here so you can map these to different functions as well. And lastly, we also have at the bottom some sensors. So we have the flow sensor and temperature in and out for the water. So if you're doing an exotic water cooling loop, you can set it up and have the sensors to monitor your system, monitor your liquid and make sure that you're actually operating well. Um, that's about it. So we will be using this mobile board in the upcoming review. So make sure to subscribe so you don't miss that and we'll see you guys in the next one.